Hello, everyone, and welcome to another interview with the vitamin D experts. I'm Jen Aliano with Grassroots Health, and today I'm excited to be here with Dr. Neil Caro. Uh, we'll be speaking at the upcoming Empowering Health with Vitamin D Symposium held in Canada on International Vitamin D Day, November 1st. Uh, just can you give me a brief overview of some of the research that you've done on vitamin D and vitamin K? Well, this is a new area for us. Um, we actually, uh, over the last year, I'd say we've, we've come to realize that it's actually more, much more complex than, than vitamin D. Vitamin K2 is involved. Vitamin A is involved and magnesium are involved. So I actually have a, a student who's using a zebrafish as a model to look at the interactions with vitamin D and magnesium. And we would like to include vitamin K into that. But when you start looking at interactions, it becomes really hard to experimentally tease out how do they interact and, and what is biologically meaningful. So it's not easy to do. Um, I guess we, we started out with, um, I'll share our screen with you here, where's that? We we just did a literature review and we got it published about a month ago. Um, and this is where we start to do all of our work as we, we find out what's out there in the literature. And so this was on vitamin K and its impact on human and animal health. And um, so that was just published and you can find that in current issues of molecular biology and uh, you find that on PubMed. So it's an interesting article, but um, just to show you some of the interesting connections, I'm gonna show you a table that is in that paper where we're looking at a group of proteins, they're called GLA proteins, and they require um, an enzyme to activate them. So we were talking in the last section about genes and, and a protein. So the genes encode the recipe to make the protein. The proteins are sometimes produced, but not actually functional. So they need to be modified. And in this case, they're modified by an enzyme that requires vitamin K2 as a cofactor to carry out the reaction to activate this protein. So we call these GLA proteins, and here you have several of them are involved in regulating calcium levels. Some of them, this one here, osteocalcin, it regulates calcium and helps it to sequester into the bone. And this one here, matrix gla GLA protein, also is involved in regulating calcium. Um, so there's a whole bunch of these proteins that, that therefore require of vitamin K to become activated, calcium binding proteins. But down here, we have a bunch that are related to the blood clotting system. So in order, if we get an injury, we have to have a blood clot to prevent blood loss. Um, right away, we have what we call the fibrinolytic system kicks in to break down those clots because clots aren't something you want in a blood vessel for a long period of time because they restrict the blood flow. And if a clot breaks off and then it starts flowing downstream, it gets into a smaller, smaller, smaller blood vessel and into a capillary, then it can plug and, and cause severe tissue damage. We could have an embolism if it occurred in your brain. So we have this regulation where we, we want to produce clots, but we want to break them down quickly too and efficiently. And it turns out that several of these proteins that are involved in producing blood clots and regulating the amount of blood clots that formed are also these GLA proteins. So we need vitamin K2 to, to activate, well, vitamin K1 as well, to activate and, and regulate the, the uh, clotting system as well. Now, here's a, a column that I, I added just to the slide. It turns out, we, we talked about Vitamin D acts as a transcription factor when it binds to the vitamin D receptor. So it's actually the receptor that's a transcription factor. Turns out that these two GLA proteins have a response element in the promoter region that requires vitamin D receptor to bind to induce those genes. So what that means is we need vitamin D to be able to interact with the vitamin D receptor to regulate these proteins that regulate calcium levels. So there's a connection there when it comes to calcium and 
vitamin D and vitamin K2. And, and that has important implications because years ago, um, women were told to prevent osteoporosis, take vitamin D and take calcium. And it turned out that they started getting what we call hypercalcemia. The blood, the, the blood vessels were being deposited with calcium. So it affects the blood flow. So you end up having cardiovascular problems. We now know that if you have sufficient amounts of vitamin K2 in your diet, or if you're supplementing, that will help to prevent that because it redirects the calcium into the bone marrow where it needs to be rather than being plugging up the, the blood vessels. So there's an interesting connection there. We haven't even explored the magnesium part and the vitamin A part. Well, we have, but uh, I'm the wrong person to ask about that right now. <laughs> I think the bottom line <laughs> is that none of these nutrients work in isolation. They all work together um, to produce these functions optimally, especially, you know, if you're if you're missing one or you're low in one, um, that might just inhibit the optimal function. So your body might not make enough of the protein that is needed. But if you have sufficient levels of each of these nutrients, then that helps to optimize the entire process. Correct. Right. So in terms of vitamin D and vitamin K2, um, what I'm understanding is that... Um, if you're taking vitamin D and you're not getting enough vitamin K2, there is this possibility of the calcium being deposited into the blood vessels instead of into the bone. Is that correct? Uh, yes, but it would depend on how much vitamin D you're taking. And it also would depend on how much calcium you're getting in your diet too, right? Um, so again, I, I think uh, measuring your vitamin D levels would be ideal. Um, Measuring vitamin K levels is a little more complex, actually, and, and uh, we are exploring, we'd like to develop an assay to measure vitamin K2 levels in the blood as well, but um, it's not as straightforward. I, obviously, you could do it with mass spec analysis, but that would be the most expensive way to do it. So we're looking for a higher throughput, cheaper way of doing it. Now, can you get enough vitamin K just from your diet? Absolutely. K2 specifically? Yes, you certainly could. Um, so if if you're, uh, there are certain ethnic groups that already do. Uh, for example, the Japanese, they love to eat something called natto. It's a fermented soybean paste. My wife uh, brings it home occasionally. It's too sticky for me, but if you put it in the soup, it's not bad. Um, they, uh, in Japan, you can get it at 7-Eleven. It's delicious. They they put the, uh, the natto in with rice and they wrap it up with a, a seaweed uh, roll. So it's kind of like a little sushi roll. And uh, it's really quite delicious. But if you get like a daily serving of that, you are getting, oh my gosh, over, I think it's 1,100, uh, I have to check the units. I think it's 1,100 micrograms or MCG a day, if you have a daily supply of this, that's way more than the rest of us get, even if you're taking a supplement. So natto would be the probably the best way to go if you had a little bit every day. But there are other fermented foods that are high as well, um, uh, not nearly as high, but um, um, sauerkraut, for example, uh, kimchi, um, cheeses. So fermented dairy products would also have vitamin K in it. Um, there are green vegetables that would also have vitamin K, but the levels are much lower than, than you would see in those fermented foods. And you've got vitamin K1 and vitamin K2. Um, is it true that the body can convert some of that K1 into K2 uh, or, or not? Yes, uh, you need to read our paper then. So yes, that is true. So K1 can be converted by the liver into uh, a type of K2, which is called MK4. There are actually, I think, 13 different forms of vitamin K2. And MK4 is naturally converted in the liver from vitamin K1. Our supplement contains MK7, which is um, what you would find in natto, but ours doesn't come from natto. And it's more bioavailable and it has a longer half-life. So you can detect higher levels in the blood for a longer period of time. That would presumably be 
uh, a better product to have. Unfortunately, it's the most expensive of them. And is there a difference between how the MK4 and the MK7 interact with the uh, genes that are needed to build the proteins to put the calcium where it needs to go and interact with vitamin D? I haven't seen that. Uh, the only thing that I've seen in the literature is they talk about the half-life. Now, that's a possibility, and that re would require binding assays, for example, to see you know how well does this variant of, of vitamin K2 interact with uh, the enzyme that's activating these GLA proteins. It could be done, but I haven't seen it. Now, um, the gut is responsible for creating a lot of different nutrients, including vitamin K. Correct. It, if somebody has a healthy gut, would it be able to produce enough vitamin K to, uh, you know, to supplement somebody who's taking vitamin D or is there, um, does the gut have to be optimized, healthy? I mean, is, is there a way for the amount of vitamin K to be produced in the gut and, or gotten from the diet, uh, to support somebody who's supplementing with, let's say, 5,000 IU of vitamin D. Yeah. So I would say you could certainly get it by eating a fermented food that contains that vitamin K2 in it. Um, yes, you're right. Our microbiota does produce vitamin K. Most of it's produced in the lower colon. And so we don't absorb most of that. So it would get excreted. So unless you're a rabbit, which are, call them coprophagic, uh, you probably wouldn't benefit from that so much. Whereas a rabbit, if they eat their own little pellets, they might get that. That's very interesting. I was taught um, in nutrition school way long ago uh, that we didn't have to take vitamin K because our gut produced it. So that sounds like it's not the case. Well, it is true, but most of it's not absorbed, apparently. Okay, so then... Mm. Do you think it is necessary for everyone to supplement with vitamin K um, if they're not getting a lot of fermented foods in their diet? Yes, I, I do. And um, so obviously the natural approach would, would be the best. So have the fermented foods in your diet. If you're not getting that, then there is no harm in taking vitamin K. Um, we know that people who have consuming that natto, for example, their blood levels of vitamin K are very, very high. And the supplements that I've seen that are on the market and our own supplement as well, um, I am consuming over, I think it's 200 micrograms per day, I think that is. I have to check the units if it's micrograms or nanograms. I think it's micrograms. Um, no, no adverse effects at all. Okay. Thank you. Is there, um, anything else, any key points about the relationship between vitamin D and vitamin K, uh, that you would like to bring up? Um, no, I, I don't think so. I just would, if you are consuming, like there, there are some, it depends on the protocol that you take for vitamin D. There are, uh, I prefer that you take a, a lower dose every day. Uh, whereas some other protocols recommend taking uh, 10,000 up to 50,000 international units once a week. Um, and, and that's a big surge of vitamin D. Um, it might certainly be a good idea to to be taking vitamin K2. Um, there, and there is no harm in doing it. If you're trying to cut costs, then go and get some natto and get used to it. <laughs> that's that's what I would recommend. Otherwise, take it in a supplement. Okay. Okay. So um, just to kind of wrap this up, uh, in your expert opinion, when it comes to vitamin D um, supplementing, with vitamin D, what are the benefits versus the risks of not also supplementing with vitamin K? Do you think there are risks if somebody is supplementing with vitamin D, but not and, also supplementing with vitamin K? 
Again, it depends on the dose. Um, if we're supplement, like my colleague has to supplement with, uh, I think he said 10,000 international units a day of vitamin D to make sure his blood levels are high enough. So if, if you are targeting uh, an optimal range in your blood uh, and that, that varies. You guys have different levels than, than what we have. They're pretty similar though. Um, if you target that range, then I don't think you need to worry about uh, hypercalcemia occurring. Um, so you may not need it. I, I take it because I, there are other immunological benefits of taking vitamin K as well. Okay. Well, thank you so much for that, Dr. Caro. Okay. Um, I, again, appreciate the time that you spent with us today and okay. I'm very excited to get this information out.